Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Coffee with Envision. I'm Dana Walkoff, President and CEO of Envision Networks, and I have a couple of announcements before we start today's presentation of Music Research in the Age of Digital. We encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. Please send your questions to Dave Hintz at DaveH at EnvisionNetworks.com. That is up on your screen. Again, it's Dave, the letter H, at EnvisionNetworks.com, and we'll try and answer as many as we can when we get to the end of today's webinar. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and we'll send you the link to it after the uh, presentation has been completed. You can also use that recorded version for future playback playback and share that with others. So again, no reason to take notes. Sit back, relax, enjoy, and uh, hopefully you'll walk away with some uh, valuable information when it's all said and done. Having said that, I'm pleased to introduce to you today's host, Hal Fish. Hal has been the programmer of WRKZ-FM, The Blitz, in Columbus, Ohio since 1992. Today, Hal's the Vice President of Programming and Operations for The Blitz, and sister station 103.9 Jack FM. Hal was an early proponent of using research to help program radio stations, and in 2000, he founded Radio Tracks, an online listener music research survey program. Since then, he's developed additional research tools to help his and other radio stations maximize their on air sound to build both AQH and QM. The Audient Digital Suite includes Radio Tracks, SAM, a sentiment analysis module and Songbug offered through Envision Networks. He's a respected programmer, a creator, a musician. Everyone, please welcome Hal Fish. Hal, over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Danny. Dan, I appreciate it. It's uh, great to be here to discuss music research in the age of digital. Um, talking about research today, fielding music research studies, and those uh, that's always been a challenge. Fielding music research, challenging in days gone by also, challenging in the digital age, but it's now totally transformed, and uh, this process uh, presents a unique set of challenges, and at the same time, a unique set of opportunities that's allowing us to interact with our listeners within the digital realm, a realm that they're, uh, they're living in today. Before we talk specifically about those opportunities, I'd like to take a quick look back and trace the roots of the methods currently in use. Before cell phones and uh, Smartphones showed up in everyone's uh, purse or pocket. Most of the research was initiated with a phone call to a home phone on a landline. And the two standard types of music research in use were call-out and auditorium music testing. Call-out was and, and still is for some used to test current and recurrent music typically. And auditorium testing primarily used to test your library tracks. For both types of research, a call screener would sit in a room somewhere with a list of phone numbers, uh, maybe a phone book, and randomly call households in the listening area, uh, your listening area, seeking participants. Uh, for call out, when you found a proper listener, you do the test right there on the phone, play them song hooks, collect their preferences right there. For auditorium testing, that call would be to recruit listeners to show up at uh, maybe a local hotel banquet room or an auditorium and you'd play them hooks, maybe four or 500 titles and collect your listener preferences on those songs that are in your library and it all worked pretty well back in the day uh, when pretty much everyone still had a landline or today when they would actually they might actually pick up that landline fewer and fewer people seem to have them back around 2000 a few companies including ours had developed online song rating systems we weren't the first but we do go back to around 2000 and the great internet research debate began and by that i mean you had traditional research companies uh, selling against internet research companies like us, and they, their, their contention was that our system uh, wasn't random enough. As you recall, they would kind of set this big net and call people all over their listening area trying to find random participants, and that our system was self-selecting radio stations, soliciting participation on the air and so forth, and then listeners would select themselves to participate, and that our research was all P1s. And uh, internet research companies would then kind of counter with traditional research is too expensive, which it was very expensive, still is expensive to field. And everyone selects themselves at some point anyway. And so you guys don't get enough P1. So there, there was the, uh, there was the debate. But I'm not here to sell against call out auditorium because some people still use it. And if you can afford to do it and you can, uh, are able to field participants, then there is not necessarily 
I'm not saying there's not value there, but I think that old school debate is long dead by necessity due to the predominance of cell phone only households and mobile usage. Everyone's had to adapt, and um, you know, even the uh, traditional companies, most of them are using some sort of digital online component to complete their surveys today anyway. So one thing you can still be certain of is um, web-based research is definitely more cost efficient. Uh, are web-based data and results better? In some ways, they are. It's certainly in terms of our ability to access listers and get to our data quickly, yes. And, uh, but it is different. And it requires some additional skills to interpret because it is indeed primarily P1s providing the results. What hasn't changed, everyone still has an opinion, and we still need to know what that opinion is. Um, how, do you, how do we access those opinions? How do we reach those listeners? What we do know from our studies here at Radio Tracks and the number of surveys that get done here is that about 70%, as of last year, 70% of all of our studies, research studies, completed on, were, were being completed on a mobile device, and that, that continues to rise. We, we've looked at studies this year where we're upwards to 80% of people utilizing mobile devices to complete these surveys, so it's clearly very important that we utilize systems that participants can use on their mobile devices. Virtually everybody has one. It's how we interact with friends, relatives, and certainly um, our favorite radio stations. Let's talk about testing in the digital age. Clearly, listeners are engaged, engaging in interactive experiences via mobile devices all the time, from the comfort of their home, at work, on the run. We see, we're frustrated by those people we see in front of us at the stoplight who won't seem to go when the light turns green because they're sitting there looking at their phone, so they're everywhere. Uh, does all this mobile activity mean that, um, that radio listeners are so busy doing other things like social media and texting back and forth and playing with apps that they're spending less time listening to music? Well, studies tell us no, resoundingly, actually. Uh, Americans spend about, actually over 32 hours a week listening to music in 2017, and that's up five and a half, half hours over the previous year. And I've seen Nielsen studies that show that that number is just going up. Listeners care very much about music. They care more than ever, which means you need data more than ever. And uh, the most direct way to reach survey respondents is through some sort of research management program that is mobile, providing the same ease of access as the, the social and text platforms and so forth and all those things that listeners are engaging with every day. There isn't a free magic bullet do-it-yourself program. You've got to do your homework, find a system that's versatile and, uh, and, and suits your needs. You may have some um, you know, there may be some there may be some additional research needs that you have, but obviously, when we're talking about research, we're talking about um, music research. That's going to be the the baseline here. You're looking for a a music testing platform for sure, and there there could be some additional questions you may ask while you're searching for a system. Does the platform offer more than just music testing? Can you test other elements of your station, spots, imaging, promos, that sort of thing? Maybe a morning show segment. Is the platform responsive? And this one is. This one is super important, and by response, I mean can listeners participate regardless of the device that they're using? Cross-platform cross compatibility is essential in this equation. How many times have you looked uh, look up something on your phone, try to make a reservation, or you know maybe you're you're just online somewhere on your phone, and and you're frustrated by that experience, and then you find that you can do things much more simply if you just bring it up on your desktop or you know your home home computer. The system that you choose needs to be mobile from the ground up. We, we talked about how everybody's doing everything mobile, and, and most of our surveys are being completed on mobile. So that experience that uh, that they're having on mobile has got to be as good, if not better, than it is on desktop. So it's got to be mobile ground up. What's the methodology? Uh, our systems, for instance, provide a traditional call-out style song rating system where participants rate songs on a scale of one through five. It's called the Likert scale. And um, you know, many of you who've done research in the past are probably very familiar with that, where five is the, the most positive rating you can give and one the lowest. Um, I'll toot our own horn a little bit here. We do have a, we also have a system that Dano mentioned called SAM, which stands for Sentiment Analysis Module, where listeners can listen to pretty much anything, including full songs and uh, write comments 
that we then analyze. We have a proprietary algorithm that we use that looks at these comments and it comes up with a score. And we actually do that in the Likert one through five scale as well. So you can, but it doesn't have to just be music. And, and again, we're sort of traditional call out is the hooks. Uh, you can put pretty much anything in Sam, uh, including full songs. You could test um, new unfamiliar music or a commercial or some segment from your morning show, as I previously alluded to. And again, all on a, on a mobile platform. For sure, you're going to be testing hooks on your music system. So you got to wonder and, uh, and ask the question, who's going to be responsible for paying uh, the cost of the music hooks? Uh, at Radio Tracks, we are, by the way. We have something called Easy List that you go in and call up a list of songs and put into your test. Uh, but you ask, is this part of the package? Is there a cost for hooks above and beyond the agreement for the system that you'll be using? So that's an important question. How do you target these listeners, your P1s? Well, you you target, well, let's talk about P1s first because you know I mentioned earlier how internet research is primarily P1s. And I, we, you know that's not something, you know, like I said, that old argument is is pretty much over with. If you're doing internet research, over 90% of the listeners who interact with with our products, with with anyone's research survey system, are going to be P1s to your radio station. Meaning that those are the people that are responsible for the most listening occasions, time spent listening to your particular station. And um, and what is it that what is the old formula? 30% of your QM or P1s, but they're responsible for 70% of the listening. So kind of a big deal that you're talking to P1s. It is a different kind of a uh, an overlay in terms of your results than you're getting with the old traditional systems, which which had more P2s and P3s and maybe would have maybe 30, if you're lucky, 40% P1s. So we're talking about a lot of P1s. The survey solicitation that you do, though, no matter what system you use, whether it's ours or somebody else's, you're going to be doing pretty much these same things in the age of digital when it comes to soliciting people to your your internet research. Promote over the air. You're going to do that. Do some live reads, get uh, promos produced, telling people how to find your surveys. I recommend, I strongly recommend using a text system with a keyword that you can promote on the air when you when you do a live read or in your promo that activates the listener instantly to your music test. I think that's really important. Um, probably the most effective strategy that you can to get bulk numbers into your surveys are email campaigns. Uh, utilize a, an existing listener database. You know, these are these are highly effective, and there are, you know, I've talked to programmers. They worry about spamming their listeners by sending them too many things uh, in these lists. I I wouldn't worry about that. We're talking about soliciting to a survey once or twice a month. I mean, if you can if you can field a bunch of people once a week, that's great. But most people don't do it that often or have time to do surveys that often. So you're, you're talking about once or twice a month in most cases. And these listeners, these are people that have opted into stuff for your radio station. They've opted in because they want you to contact them about stuff they care about with your station. Believe me, they care about your music. That's why they're there. So don't be afraid to use your listener database to solicit uh, people to your music tests. Be sure to post a survey link on your website. Make it obvious. Don't bury it below the fold or behind a link that says music or features or something else. This is important. So you, know, you want to have that survey link or your solicitation to your survey someplace where they see it when they when they uh, land on your site. You can use social media channels. It used to be about, you know, I think Facebook used to be a little more effective than it is now. They've, they've changed their algorithms so that it's a little more difficult to get links to people that like you on Facebook. Uh, I, I suggest using video. Uh, you can do that on Facebook and be a little more effective if you're, if you're soliciting people to a music test. <clears throat> Excuse me, Snapchat is something that you might Try with a with an announcer if you've got somebody that's known to your audience and they want to shoot something out and Snapchat something out um, that that again I would use that with a text uh, keyword so they're just saying you know text test to nine nine seven six nine or or some short code Twitter is is good for that as well and don't gamble with the results I would say uh, make sure you're you're planning ahead strategize. Try to figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish with your testing. Of course, obviously you're you're looking to find out what people think of your music, but in what other what other strategies you might have with your testing. Uh, will your provider help you do that strategizing? Who's going to interpret those results? You, of course, 
we'll be interpreting them if you have experience with web te web based music testing but what if you don't well your provider consults you on this uh, make sure your provider is willing to walk you through everything and kind of help you read the tea leaves if you will uh, i guess i guess i guess i'm saying that you know make sure you've got a, a good back end service provider and this is this is where we'll blow our horn a little bit here uh, we've been doing online testing since back around 2000 so there's not a whole lot we haven't seen and and i think we've got a pretty good idea of how to interpret certain tracks. Um, you know, let's say you've got a first time track on there that shows up in the bottom third of your result, results and you're wondering if it has any potential, we can kind of help you read those tea leaves and figure some things out. So, but in the end, it's your station and you make the final decision on what what makes it to the air and what stays on the air and how you want to doctor your rotations as you move songs, songs through them. Ultimately, you need to find a provider that helps you trust the research and then follow the results and program accordingly. Terrific. Thanks, Hal. And I think we have time uh, for a few questions here. So uh, first one is coming from Bailey. She writes, I'm not sure how to interpret the results and don't have anyone here with music test experience. How can I get help to know what the results actually mean? Well, Bailey, I like, kind of like said, I mean, it, it's nice if your provider can strategize with you, but if you know somebody in the business that you can, you know, place a call, maybe a programmer that that uh, will give you a hand. I mean, these days I think things are a little less crazy competitive market to market where, you know, if you if you know a programmer in a different market, they say, hey, you know, have you done some research before? You might be able to get a hand there. And, and of course, but I think it's important that it, you know, whatever system you pick, that you you find a a provider that can get in there and help you do that. I think that's just part of the the process for the system that you're using. Um, none of us likes to buy some software or download an app and then just be kind of let loose with it and say, "Here you go, good luck." So, I think it's important that your provider be able to help you out there. Next question is from Mackenzie. Uh, she writes, you talked about music hooks, but can you explain how to determine the hooks format and how to place them in a music survey? Um, the, the hook format is you're looking for, and, and, and think of this, you know, where hooks are, aren't used to familiarize people with the music that's being tested. These are gonna be eight, 10, 12 seconds, probably tops in length. So they're going to be used to check and see if your audience is familiar. Most systems, including ours, uh, for instance, don't even allow someone to give feedback on a hook if they're unfamiliar with it. So uh, you know when you're putting when you're formatting your hooks up, you're looking for that part of the song um, that is would be most familiar to people when they hear it, um, and then and make them no more than I would say eight to twelve seconds in length. Our system. I mentioned we have an easy, what we call easy list, and you can kind of go down. So we have those preloaded in. Um, if there's a hook with us or any provider that, look, I don't, I'm not satisfied with this particular hook, I would suggest that they change it. A lot of people will, there, there are a number of companies that have deals with outside hook providers, and you may have to pay for those extra hooks, but then you, are, you can also maybe choose which hooks you want. Okay. And then um, the last question comes from, it's either Matt Bear or Matt the Bear. Uh, you'll take your pick, Al, but your audience product has a lot of parts to it. Are they all required to use to get the best results? Uh, parts and features, I would say, as, as opposed to parts. But yeah, we do have a, a number of features and parts to our